Hi there, everybody, and welcome back to another stock analysis video. Today, we are going to be analyzing the company Encore Wire, which is actually brought up by one of the commenters in my Real Tinto, uh, Raja Bolar. Sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly, but he pretty much just said, by the way, great profile picture. Super Saiyan 4 Goku, awesome. Is Wire and WFT stocks a good buy? Well, I'm not going to necessarily tell you if it's a good buy or not. You have to make that assumption for yourself, but we can still analyze them using discounted free cash flow and see what we can come up with. All right. So with that said, let's get started with this analysis. Now we're going to come right into the dividend summary, guys. This company does pay a dividend, though it's actually kind of weird about it. You'll see what I mean when we actually go through with this. But nonetheless, a dividend yield, guys, of 0.08% which ends up being $0.02 cents per share for an annual payout of $0.08 cents per share uh, annually. Payout ratio is 0.25%, five-year growth rate, and the dividend growth, meaning how many years they have grown this, di this dividend consecutively, is both zero. Now, this was actually very, very peculiar. So I went into the dividend history and noticed that in the five-year, they haven't grown this dividend at all. And I was just like, oh, okay, uh, kind of weird right there, but sure. 10 year at still the same two two cents okay and now looking at the max ever since their inception in 2007 guys they have never grown this dividend so it's not a good dividend play because you don't really have any growth but you do have consistency you will always be guaranteed eight cents annually per share right so do with that as you will x dividend date pass as of june 30th payout date is actually going to be july 15th and they pay their dividends quarterly Let's come now into the calculator, guys. Starting, of course, with the ticker symbol of W-I-R-E, wire, market cap, really small market cap of around $2.1 billion, PE of 3.28, which is actually really, really tiny. I like to buy anything under 20, and the fact that there's a 3.28 with $105.48 per share right now, you know, that's kind of telling me that this thing might actually be worth a whole lot more. But we're going to be using the discounted free castle to see what we can actually get from these guys. So looking into this dividend of eight cents, which, you know, it's very, very consistent. It actually ends up being, guys, only 1.5 or essentially 1.6 million dollars being paid on dividends every single year in regards to their current shares outstanding. Now, if we take a look at the five-year average free cash flow and take that number and then subtract this amount of dividends being paid out every single year, Guys, they're still left with around $79.76 million left. And if we take a look at the last year's free cash flow and do the same math, they still have left, guys, almost $300 million in their cash flow. In regards to a payout ratio to the last year's free cash flow, this is only half of a percent. And for the five-year average free cash flow, it doesn't even get to 2%. So as it stands, even though this dividend isn't growing, right? Even though this dividend is not growing, it is very, very consistent. Now let's take a look at some fundamentals. The net income five years ago of $67 million to one year ago of $541.4 million. Guys, that is a massive increase of 708%. Now, the problem I have with net income, and by the way, I'm gonna have this problem throughout the next two profit metrics because it's, it's a pretty big deal. And for all of those of you watching the video, you can pretty much just see it. Five years ago, guys, 67 million. Four years ago, 78.2 million. Three years ago, 58.1 million. Two years ago, 76.1 million. And then one year ago, 541 million. What caused this massive, massive jump in their net income? By the way, we see this again in the free cash flow and we see this again in the revenue. I have no clue what in the world happened here. This is not consistent at all. And it kind of throws an entire wrench into my system of analyzing a company because I don't know if they're able to replicate this into the future. The one thing that I could think as to why this happened is because inflation has gone up, prices in general have gone up, and seeing that they make uh, copper and aluminum wiring for commercial businesses, probably their prices have gone up as well because of inflation, and this results in the net income being higher. Aside from that, I can't really put my finger on why the net income one year ago is this high. Now let's take a look at the free cash flow. Guys, the most important profit metric that we have because cash flow is what companies use to essentially operate. It is cash from operations, 
minus or plus your capital expenditures because capital expenditures are automatically negative so you want to add them you don't want to subtract but i digress essentially companies use their free cash flow to pay out a dividend which they have a dividend they use cash flow to essentially pay out this dividend they can buy back shares they can pay down their debt they can make acquisitions and overall grow the company, which is similar to making acquisitions. One is inorganic, the other one is organic, but that's beside the point. Now, we see a very, very similar situation to the free cash flow as we just saw with the net income, right? Five years ago of $26.2 million to one year ago of $300.1 million, increase of 1,045%. And the five-year average free cash flow, $81 million. Guys, the same exact thing that we just saw with the net income is with the free cash flow. And actually, a little bit worse because two years ago, they actually went negative to negative $28.6 million. But I could actually give them the benefit of the doubt for this because essentially COVID happened, right? So if this is due to COVID, which let's face it, 90% chance, maybe even 95% chance that it was, we can essentially ignore this number, right? But even still, even still, they do not have a track record of being $300 million or higher, right? Their track record is barely at the $60 million mark. So I don't necessarily know what to make of this. And lastly, looking at the revenue, we got five years ago of $1.2 billion to one year ago of $2.6 billion, increase of 122.7%. And again, same exact thing. Five years ago of $1.2 billion, four years ago of $1.3 billion, three years ago or around 1.3 billion again then two years ago of around once again 1.3 billion and then it just shot up to 2.6 billion dollars same exact thing guys i have no idea what caused this massive uptick one year ago if you guys know please leave it in the comment section below now let's analyze some balance sheet numbers so then of course with their total assets minus the total liabilities guys if the company doesn't have the assets to cover their liabilities chances are if we go into a recession they will probably go bankrupt, right? You do not want this. You want a company to be able to cover their liabilities, which includes their debts, with their assets if hit, if things really do get really bad, right? Now, currently, when it comes to them, they're pretty good, right? They're at $1.4 billion, and within the past five years, they have been increasing this difference as well, which is very, very good to see as well. Average total assets is around $1.1 billion. Average liabilities is around $138.45 million. One is in the billion, the other one is in the millions. And doing this difference, we get $960.3 million. Now let's take a look at the cash flow minus the liability. Guys, even though assets minus liabilities is a good metric to see if a company's assets is able to cover their liabilities, what did I just say when we covered the free cash flow? This is what companies use to pay down debts. So let's do this exact same thing using the total liabilities and the cash flow. Let's take the cash flow, subtract the total liabilities and see if maybe they are paying down their liabilities. Now, this is actually the first time I see this. I did not see this while I was inputting the numbers. And this is hilarious to me because throughout the past five years, essentially they were in the, in the negatives, right? And then when COVID hit two years ago, they took on a little bit more debt. Probably their cash flow went down as we saw, right? Their cash flow went to the negatives, which means that, you know, their cash flow minus the liabilities went even deeper into the negatives. So that's kind of a COVID thing. I'm going to pretty much ignore it. But looking at five to three years ago, they were essentially in the red, right? But, but because they had such a massive uptick in last year's cash flow, they're now in the positive cash flow minus liabilities. That is hilarious to me. Essentially, what this is telling me is that if they want to, they could take last year's cash flow and completely pay off their liabilities in one fell swoop and still have left $108 million left. That is amazing to see. So, you know, hopefully they do that. Maybe they would. I don't necessarily know what they'll do, right? But nonetheless, that's essentially what this is telling me. Very, very good. Now, taking the average cash flow and doing the average liabilities and doing this difference, we get around negative $41.54 million. Now, let's take a look at the shares outstanding, a metric that companies tend to fail more often than not, especially companies that are tiny like this, right? They're not really big mega caps or especially if they really don't even have a dividend, right? If they don't have a dividend and they're just startups, whoo, whoo, they will issue shares. But essentially, when it comes to the shares outstanding, you want this number, guys, to be decreasing. You want the company to be buying back shares because that gives you a bigger piece of the company by default. Now, when it comes to Wire, this is actually fairly surprising. Essentially, they are buying back shares at a pretty good rate, guys. 
in both of these scenarios, right? Five years ago of 20.8 million shares to today, guys, of 19.7 million shares. That's a decrease on the five year of around 5.3%. And from the previous year to the current year, this is looking at one year ago of 20.1 million shares to today of 19.7 million shares. That's a decrease, guys, of almost 2%. That is actually really, really good. So let's take a look at this when it comes to a dividends, right? They aren't increasing that dividend. However, they are buying back shares. So the fact that they are keeping this dividend the same and buying back shares means two things. One, that essentially their payout ratio in regards to the free cash flow is decreasing. And number two is that they're giving you profits of the company through a dividend and being consistent about it as well as share appreciation just by buying back shares. That is actually really, really good to see. Like that's really, really good to see. I would have preferred it if they were to increase that dividend, but but if that's what they have done and they've been consistent with it, I don't see that as necessarily a bad thing. And lastly, when it comes to the cash and equivalents, they currently have $466.1 million, guys, with an average cash of around $270.17 million. All right, guys, now it's time to make some assumptions on what we think the company will be doing in the future. Low, medium, high using three different factors, revenue growth, projected share buyback, and of course, the Velvet Carter rate of return that we would like to get out of this company in the next four years. So for the Velvet rate of return, I like to keep it flat 10% to match the S&P 500 throughout all assumptions. First of all, revenue growth assumption. Let's come over here to Seeking Alpha and look at the revenue growth year over year and the revenue growth forward. Guys, this is really, really bad because they're just very, very far apart. Now, the reason why the revenue growth year over year is 102.5 is because they just skyrocketed last year, right? So unfortunately, this makes it a little bit difficult for me to make assumptions. Now, as part of being an investor, my job is to be conservative when it comes to these growth assumptions and to take worst case scenario while at the same time being somewhat reasonable. Do I believe that they'll do 102% again in the next four years? Probably not. So I'm going to actually put for the low assumption, guys, a low of around 15% revenue growth for the median assumption, let's say around 18 and for the high assumption, let's say around 21% revenue growth. For the projected share buyback, guys, I think that they'll probably keep it around the same, but let's just say that if things really do get bad, that they don't buy back as many shares. So let's put 2% for the low assumption, 3% for the media assumption, and 4% for the highest assumption. Now we get the target share prices, not adjusting for debt and adjusting for debt. And as you can see right here, for the lowest assumption, we get a target price of $106.26. Not too shabby, right? $118.06 for the median assumption and $131 essentially for the highest assumption. Now let's adjust for debt, guys. We take the cash and equivalents, we add the net debt, add those two numbers together, add that to the market cap that the calculator comes up with. And if they have more cash and debt, then this number comes up. If they have more debt than cash, then this number comes down. So you can see it does come up by a big amount, right? Target share price for the low assumption now is $236.67. For the mini assumption, it is $260.51. And for the highest assumption, it is $286.46. Now let's add a margin of safety on top of this target share price after debt of 5 to 15%. And in doing so, we get a target share price between $201 to around $225 for the low assumption. For the media assumption, it is $221.43 to around essentially $247.50. And for the high assumption, it is $243.50 to $272. Guys, the current share price is $105.48. So looking at all of these assumptions, you can pretty much see that it is an all out buy anywhere you look, even at my lowest assumption, right? Even at the lowest assumption, target share price, not adjusting for debt, it is still a buy by around like a dollar or so. That's amazing. So essentially what this is saying is if you were to buy this company at $106.26, if in the next four years they make 15% in revenue and they buy back 2% of shares, you are going to be making 10% returns on this company, not including dividends on top of that so that just goes to show that's actually 
really cool, honestly. The fact that this company is an all-out buy in every single scenario. Now, just because it isn't all-out buy in every single of my scenarios doesn't mean that it isn't all-out buy for your scenarios, right? I have this calculator, guys, available for free. Anybody can have it. I also have a book value one. Let me show you guys right here, as well as a re-evaluation one and even a dividend tracking sheet. I have all of these guys for you guys to have. There is a playlist where in the description there are links to all of these calculators as well as the dividend tracking sheet. You can make a copy of it and you can make your own assumptions because at the end of the day, guys, none of this was financial advice and every investment is the present value of all future cash flow. So let's just say, for example, that you don't believe that this company might do 15%. Let's just say that you think they're going to do 5% and you think that they're going to start issuing shares, right? Let's say that you're going to start issuing shares at negative 1%. Well, there you go. Now the target share price is $73.92, right? Do I believe that that will happen? No, they don't have track record. So I think that this is a fair thing enough to say 15 and two, but you know, you guys might think different. And if that's the case, then make your own assumptions, have this calculator and see what numbers you get. All I'm asking for these free calculators as well as a dividend tracking sheet is, guys, just help me grow my channel. We are so close to 700 subscribers, please. I would love to get to 700 by the end of the week. That would be amazing. Thank you all so much for those who have subscribed. I, I'm so happy. Like you have no idea. I am so happy and I'm, it makes me it makes me happy to give you guys content. It makes me happy to provide you guys uh, these calculators in order to make everybody a better investor. Like that's honestly one of the things that I love about making videos. So thank you all so much who have subscribed. And if you feel that I am giving you guys the content that you guys like, please hit that like, hit the subscribe, comment, hit that bell, tell your friends and just help me grow my channel. Now let's take a look at the dividends guys, because well, their dividends aren't nothing amazing, but they've been very consistent, right? Uh, they've been very, very consistent. So let's take a look at this. If you were to invest one month's income at the current average US income of $68,703, how much money would they actually give you in dividends annually, quarterly, and monthly? Well, doing so guys, this would buy you 54.28 shares if you were to put in $5,725. It's actually not that much. And this only gets you $4.34 in dividends annually, a dollar and nine cents quarterly and 36 cents monthly. That's not that good. <laughs> that's that's actually one of the worst dividends that I've seen from a dividend paying company. So when it comes to dividend play guys, they're consistent, but you would need a lot more dividends to be invested in this company in order to get, you know, anything remotely close to even $10, right? So it is what it is. Unfortunately, when it comes to dividends, I would say it's a pass for this. All in all, when it comes to this company, honestly, I do like their product, right? Copper and aluminum uh, coils for commercial businesses. That's pretty cool. My, my personal opinion, I like that. My one issue though is, well, the obvious. This outlier one year ago across all profit metrics. I don't know. I have no idea what to make of this. If you guys know, please tell me in the comment section below, do your own research, do further research. But just from these numbers, this is by far the biggest outlier and the one that it's kind of terrifying me because I don't know if they'll be able to replicate this. That's the problem is you, you don't know if they're able to replicate this. Aside from that, everything else looks pretty good, <laughs> like very, very good, especially this shares outstanding as well That's actually very, very good. So I would not invest in this company for a dividend play. And I would do a lot more research as to why they did that outlier last year when it came to all their profits. Aside from that, not that bad of a company. They got pretty good fundamentals. That pretty much does it for this video. Like if you like, comment, subscribe. As I said, you guys can follow me on my new tech sites. Link in the description below. So with that said, peace out. And be on the lookout for the next stock analysis of video.